Okay. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry about the uh, delay there, a little bit of technical difficulties, without which it wouldn't be a real cop. Um, but so um, I want to welcome you to the second half of Permafrost Day and this session, which is about tipping points in permafrost systems. And I'm going to give a, a short introduction before um, I invite our past first speaker just to frame this issue a little bit and explain a little bit about why we've chosen um, to do this session. Um, so tipping points is a framing that um, I'm sure, as we all know, is very commonly used in the media. It's commonly used in popular parlance. Um, and perhaps because of that, it's something that we hear a lot of questions about. It's something that I personally have, have received a lot of questions about. And it's something that we know there is a lot of interest in. And the term tipping point is it's sort of generally used to imply large scale, abrupt, um, damaging, irreversible change. But beyond that, um, having had a little bit of a, a conversation prior to this session, it's, it's actually not that easy to define what is and what is not a tipping point. Um, for example, as opposed to something that we might describe um, as a threshold. So earlier this year, um, a paper was published by uh, David McKay and colleagues, which used um, the definition that you can see up here on this slide for climate tipping points. And as the paper highlights, there are a number of elements that feed into this that are discussed in, in more detail um, in this paper and also feed into other definitions of, of tipping points. And some of these elements um, do bring a little bit of complexity along with them. So for example, how we define abruptness. The IPCC in the past um, have defined abrupt change as something that happens over a few decades or less. Um, but others have defined it differently. Um, for example, it's been defined before as something where the impact occurs faster than the cause. Um, in this paper, it's defined as something taking place at a rate that's defined by the climate system or subsystem. So the takeaway here is that what is and is not a tipping point is actually um, an interesting question, but perhaps not a simple question. And the answer is likely to be kind of a little bit dependent on the context. And that's something I think we'll be digging into in, in this session. I also want to highlight that tipping points as a phrase is, is often used, at least in the media, alongside other phrases, um, phrases like on the edge or on the brink. And arguably, um, this framing is not the most helpful, or uh, maybe it's even problematic. So I say that because if we're on the edge of a tipping point, does that mean that if we cross that edge, then there is a less urgent need for action, um, or that we're in some way too late? What does this mean? And who is it that we are describing as being on that edge? We know from discussions that we've had here in this pavilion and elsewhere at COP that for many communities, both within the Arctic, um, for example, living on permafrost systems and across the world, that already we're seeing substantial, even devastating impacts of climate change, something that we perhaps would not describe as being on the brink. So with, with that in mind, um, in this session, we're hoping to answer some of those questions that we, we hear about tipping points and perhaps move um, together towards a, a more productive framing of um, this broader idea of thresholds and um, irreversibility. And so uh, without taking up any more time, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Gustav Hugelius, who is the Vice Director of the Bolin Center of Climate Research. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you very much for that introduction and thanks for coming to listen to our sessions where we we'll try to you know, give, give some nuance or discussion around the concept of tipping points. Uh, and I'm going to start with a really broad scale overview of the permafrost carbon feedback and tipping points uh, based on uh, previous research, some of my own, my own research and, and some, some synthesis and also including some IPCC work. Uh, so far, this is the picture that we're seeing and that we're projecting into the future. Every ton of CO2 has added linearly to global warming if we start in the pre-industrial looking forward. Uh, the graph you're, you're seeing here is from the recent working group one report of the IPCC AR6. You see cumulative CO2 emissions since 1850 on the x-axis and global warming on the y-axis. Uh, and at least leading up to uh, uh, 
up to 2050, this uh, this relationship is is pretty linear. There's some divergence between the different SSPs, but not much. Uh, and of course, the concern, as we're talking when we're discussing tipping points, is that instead of a linear future, we would be moving into something like this with you know rapid irreversible acceleration of 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 emission due to other sort of natural feedbacks in the system and this is just you know a crude hand drawn line this is not not anything exact but this is the notion that we're going to be be discussing whether this is what we're what we're moving into uh, and to sort of frame this discussion um it's really important to think about i think the the sort of the role of 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 the natural feedbacks and the natural systems in the whole uh, climate change context uh this shows this graph I, with this i want to illustrate Earth's natural sinks and how these change depending on different uh, societal pathways or different emission pathways. You've probably all heard that land and oceans together are taking up roughly half of the CO2 that we emit. So well, for every you know for every two two molecules they take up one, and they've been doing the, doing us this favor since the, the since the start of the pre-industrial. Now what we're seeing and this is based on coupled model runs into the future, is that these sinks are shifting and changing, and some of them are starting to saturate or perhaps weaken a little bit uh, as we move further along. And if you look on the far right, you can see the gray fraction of emissions that end up in staying in the atmosphere in high emission scenarios is much higher than if you look to the far left, where ocean and land are actually able to absorb absorb 70% of the emitted CO2 emissions. This is because the sinks are saturating and because of other, other behaviors. Uh, and tipping points, of course, could play a role here in, in making this, this, this trend even more exacerbated, where tipping points that are not currently in the climate models, because remember that this is based on climate model output. If we, if we think of, of feedbacks that are not in the models, be making the sinks even weaker, then this could be an, an even more dire picture. Um, but so, so this is sort of sort of the context of what we're talking about. And we're zooming in on the permafrost carbon tipping point and what that per permafrost carbon tipping point or the accelerating permafrost carbon feedback, I should say, is doing is essentially making the land sink smaller. Uh, it's already part, I mean, the permafrost system is part of the land sink as permafrost is emitting more and more, the land sink is becoming weaker and weaker, and in the high, high northern latitude, that sink might even reverse. So the land section sink of this would get smaller if we have emissions that are higher than what the models predict. Um, so we're talking about this in the context, I think, of this recent paper, that recent review of global and regional climate-driven tipping points in the Earth system. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, this this map is, is 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 from this paper, and the different colors illustrate different thresholds that were identified or discussed at least in this paper. And we're zooming in on the one that's called uh, boreal permafrost uh, or boreal for, boreal permafrost collapse, which of course includes both Arctic and boreal. It's, they've lumped the whole northern boreal region into one for this paper. And then there are all of these other tipping points that we're not touching upon today. Uh, perhaps a little bit, you, you could think of us talking about the boreal forest expansion, I guess, in the context of fire and other feedbacks. But um, So they have the, the boreal, boreal uh, permafrost tipping point labeled as with the threshold above four degrees in this case. We'll get back to that a little bit later. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about feedbacks in general, because a positive or a negative feedback is a self-reinforcing mechanism in the climate system. Uh, so that you know, it, uh, emissions either trigger processes that make the climate cooler or stronger. So it's self-reinforcing in the feedback, which is not self-perpetuating, as, as in the case of the, the definition we just heard for, for tipping points. This is from the IPCC again, and it shows the feedbacks that are included in the models. Uh, you have the cooling feedbacks to the left and the warming feedbacks to the right. So you have the two big blue bars are the land carbon response to CO2 and the ocean carbon response to CO2. And these are essentially these, these things that I talked about in the beginning. The strength, the, you know, the, how, how the Earth system is helping us by buffering the, the emission and taking a lot of it up as a cooling feedback. Uh, but these are both feedbacks to CO2 itself. So it's the rising concentration, not the warming, that is driving these feedbacks. And that is quite important. 
when it comes to response to the actual warming, so land carbon and ocean carbon response to climate, that's actually a, a positive feedback that is warming the climate. So the warming is making it worse, the CO2 is making it better somehow in this feedback specifically, but of course the CO2 is, is driving the warming itself. Um, so, and if you, if we take a look at, the, at, this is a look at the global carbon cycle. This graph is slightly old now, but I still like it, so I, I, I keep using it. We don't need to get into the numbers per se, but this just shows the storage and fluxes of carbon in the Earth system, which is, and it's, per, it's perturbations to this, this carbon cycle that we're, that we're talking about here. Uh, and I just want to bring your attention to, if you can see it, you have this, these red numbers uh, on, the, on the upper far left, which is for photosynthesis. You see 120, which is the big flux, and then plus three. And the plus three in red, that is the, is the added photosynthesis that is happening because of the CO2 fertilization from our emissions. So that is basically the, the cooling feedback that where, where the climate is taking up more CO2 as photosynthesis because the plants grow better in a high CO2 environment. So if you breathe a lot of CO2 on your house plants, they should theoretically feel, you know, grow better. It's the same for nature. If you could go over and look at the ocean, you have the air-sea gas exchange there, and there's it, you have a number of 90 petagram plus two going into the ocean. That's the same. That's the oceans both being more productive, but also just dissolving more CO2 into the ocean because of the increase of, from, from, from our emissions. And then we have the part that we're really concerned about, which somehow ends up in, in the soil here, where you have microbial respiration and decomposition of soil carbon, which is the, the important process for, perma, for the permafrost feedback, where, where uh, soil is thawing and then emitting carbon. So I, I had, we had this graph where we showed the feedbacks that were in the models. Now there's, this is from the same graph, another section of it, which shows the carbon cycle climate feedbacks that are not in the, in the, in the Earth system models. Uh, in the in the recent reports, this is fire response to climate, permafrost response to climate, and wetland response to climate. So the IPCC acknowledges very well that all of these feedbacks are missing, uh, and they try to account for them in other ways in the report. Uh, you can just note that the, taken together, this equals roughly five to ten percent of the the the, the total human radiative forcing of 2.7 watts per square meter that we've seen so far. Uh, the bad news is, so they, they, they quantified the feedbacks. They, even if they weren't in the models, they included it in the remaining emission budgets. That's also really good. Uh, the bad news is that the permafrost response is probably bigger than what they, they it, It's quite a conservative estimate of the permafrost response, uh, which you might, uh, uh, which uh, you would have, we have talked about this in earlier sessions, and we're getting to it here now, which this has to do with abrupt thaw processes not being fully included. Uh, in their in their estimates. So the IPCC also looked at to what extent climate change is reversible. Uh, this also relates a lot to a lot to tipping points. And they asked this question: Could climate change be reversed by moving carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? And they say yes, if it comes to global surface temperature change. But it will take it. With, there will be lag times of several years. If you're looking at permafrost extent, they also state that it's reversible, but with a lag time of decades, should perhaps be centuries. So this would you know, point towards the, you know, the IPCC not seeing at least a tipping point in permafrost extent under the scenarios we have here. Uh, they also identify other feedbacks that are not reversible. Uh, and this doesn't necessarily mean that they have tipping points. It just means that they act on very long time scales. In this case, we see the example of ocean thermal expansion that will keep going as a response to, to climate change, regardless of what we do in the near term. Uh, and I want to get back to this one again. If we're, now we're looking at perma, permafrost area change again and highlight that even if it might be reversible, the, you know, the, 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 the projects or that the, the, the permafrost area might stabilize, it's stabilizing at a much lower level which gives you an area of roughly five or six million square kilometers in this case that has thawed that will keep emitting greenhouse gases for several centuries. Which means that the permafrost carbon feedback, regardless of whether we're talking about tipping points or not, is an extreme, a very long-term committed emission source to the atmosphere driven by our relatively near-term emissions. Uh, 
So this is an image illustrating this permafrost carbon feedback. Uh, I like this image because it has a massive scale to it. You have a person in front for scale. This is actually a professor from the Alfred Wegener Institute who's standing there contemplating his surroundings. Uh, but so the feedback system is that the, the, we saw the permafrost with the emitted greenhouse gases and even more greenhouse gases are then released as organic matter is decayed and microbes consume it to release CO2 and methane. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, and the scale of this problem as related to the magnitude and the size of the carbon pool that's stored in the permafrost. The bubbles in this graph are proportional in size to the sizes of the carbon pools. You have the atmosphere, which is close to 900 gigatons of carbon at present. Permafrost is part of the global soil carbon pool, which is the biggest sort of responsive carb carbon pool in the Earth system. Permafrost is roughly half of that, at, estimated here at almost 1,600 gigatons of carbon in the permafrost region, with additional unaccounted deposits in very deep permafrost. Um, so the scale of the problem, the size of the problem, relates to this enormous carbon pool. In general, carbon cycling is rather slow in, at high latitudes compared to the tropics with semi-arid ecosystems, but the magnitude over a long time is immense because of this massive stored carbon storage or carbon pool. Uh, and now the, I want to bring the, the sort of discussion back to the tipping point. Uh, and here again, I have this definition by, uh, by McKay et al. Tipping points in the climate system occur when change in part of the climate system become one, self-perpetuating, two, beyond a certain threshold, uh, which leads to three substantial and widespread Earth system feed impacts. I'm going to try to look at this definition a little bit in the context of, 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 of permafrost and, what, and what, what, what we know about that. So we have the feedback, permafrost thaw, methane and carbon dioxide release, more temperature. And then the question is then, is this self-perpetuating? We know that it's self-reinforcing, that's clear. But self-perpetuating would mean that all other things being equal, it would emit enough carbon to actually perpetuate itself. Uh, and then the second question is, do we have a threshold behavior in the permafrost carbon feedback? Are there specific temperatures where we would see thresholds that, that we need to be concerned about? Uh, the IPCC also asked this question. Uh, this is adapted from uh, Box 5.1 5 5 .1 in that report. And they stated it's unclear whether the permafrost carbon pool represents A, a coherent global tipping element of the Earth system with a single abrupt threshold which would be the, the option, if we're thinking of this option, saying that the permafrost will be tipping at four degrees of global warming, as you know, suggested by the figure that we saw. Or the other option would be B, oh, sorry, one and two, I should say, that permafrost is perhaps rather a local scale tipping point without abrupt thresholds when aggregated across the Pan-Arctic region. And they also note that this is what is currently suggested by observations and global model results. So they favor the latter a lot of local tipping points, but not a coherent threshold at the global level. Uh, and I would, you know, in general, the knowledge that we have supports that second statement. There is limited evidence for an Arctic or Pan-Arctic threshold tipping point in permafrost extent. This is one example of many that you know, we could bring up to support this argument. But on the x-axis, you see global warming at stabilization of different temperatures. And on the y-axis, you see how much permafrost will remain. This is from a nice paper that came out a few years ago. And basically, if we would have expected, if there was a threshold behavior in this extent, it would look something like the orange line. But the green line is what we're really tracking. Uh, and what this means is that we don't see evidence of a specific threshold. But it also means that every single tenth of a degree matters. Every single tenth of a degree will damage permafrost. For every degree of global warming, we lose 4 million square kilometers. So I'm not saying that it's not extremely urgent. I'm just, I'm just saying that there doesn't seem to be one particular threshold under which we are safe and beyond which we are doomed. So it's, it's a slippery slope of, uh, of a lot of loss, basically. Uh, and this is also, this is a graph from, uh, from the special report on, on, on the climate and cry or on oceans and, and cryosphere. Uh, where we see basically the same thing. Uh, projected permafrost area change in either of these scenarios does not really appear to have any, any threshold behavior and 
we do so also see that you save a lot of permafrost under the, the under the lower emission scenarios, which also has long-term implications of limiting the emissions from the permafrost system itself. Uh, with that said, and as the IPCC had also stated, we do see very extensive evidence of local scale tipping points in the permafrost system. And that's at a local scale, when you lose the ground ice in the, so the ice that is a big part of the, of the permafrost system, when that melts and drains away as water, it is not going to reform on human, you know, on our timescales. Even if the climate stabilizes again, the, ice, the ground ice does not reform. And abrupt thaw processes, they, so we see an example here, there's some people contemplating the upper corner of a massive ice wedge in the Siberian tundra in this case. This pure ice is in the soil, it's roughly 10 meters wide and 30 meters deep. And if you look at the whole volume of the ground, it's up between 50, 70, even 90% of the whole ground is made up of ice. So if that melts and drains away, the ground surface collapse. Uh, and over time, this gives you something on, like what we see on the right, the ice it diminishes, the ground surface collapse. And even if you refreeze this ecosystem, the ice is not gonna reform. So you will have, um, you know, at least on human time scales, a permanent change to this ecosystem. And you see the photograph on the bottom right shows an example of abrupt thaw in a permafrost peatland that goes from a elevated dry surface to a, a low-lying wet surface after thaw. There are different types of abrupt thaw that have been sort of lumped together and upscaled in this in this paper from a couple of years ago now, which gives sort of an, a, uh, an overall view of the term of, of the emissions associated to, to abrupt thaw landforms. You have hill slope failure, thaw lakes, and peatlands that that uh, that thaw and you know give you different different trajectories of these local abrupt tipping points. Uh, and this is sort of trying to just summarize what happens over time. In this case, it's an example from a per thawing permafrost. Well, on the far left, you have stable permafrost, and that is usually a sink of CO2, a near neutral of methane in this case, if it's a peatland. And then as the permafrost starts to degrade, it will shift to usually being a, a, a sink, sort of a source of CO2. And in the case of peatlands, usually it can remain neutral when it comes to methane. But once you move into a phase where it actually thaws and it collapses, you have a post-thaw lake that is a strong source of methane and for a while also a strong source of CO2. Over time, if we had hundreds of years in this graph, you would actually see that it would become a sink of CO2 again as, as the ecosystem becomes more productive. So this, these are dynamics that change over time. But on a time scale of a few hundred years, it will just lead to stronger radiative forcing and to be a source of warming. And this is just one example of how abrupt thaw can also be triggered quite rapidly. This is a paper that came out a few years ago now, but it shows how a few summer heat waves in the really far Canadian north, so in continuous permafrost, triggered quite massive abrupt thaw happening across the landscape in an area that wasn't supposed to thaw in, in another 70 years if you would have followed the model projections for that area. So it's just how some extreme weather events can, 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 can trigger abrupt thaw so these tipping points can, can, can be triggered by weather, by fire, by other local, uh, uh, local events. And if you add this into projected emissions from thawing permafrost, here you see you have a graph that shows different degrees of global warming. The black dot shows what the IPCC projects with mainly gradual thaw. And if you add these abrupt tipping elements of abrupt thaw happening across the Arctic, we're looking at these purple dots instead where you're seeing uh, you know, almost a doubling of, of, of emissions from these uh, systems. The units that you're seeing here should be gigatons of CO2 equivalents. I'm sorry for that. So it's, it's actually both CO2 and methane together uh, on the, on the y-axis. But so even though there's not a, you know, a global or a pan-arctic tipping point in the extent of permafrost, these local tipping points matter a lot to the, to the total carbon budget. Uh, another thing that, that will also sort of uh, make the, this even more dire is if you think of overshoot warming scenarios where we shoot past our target temperature instead of going directly to the target temperature as represented by the green line, then our feedbacks from the permafrost will drive even further warming as shown in the shaded areas. And the second problem is that this, a lot of this permafrost loss really is irreversible at human timescales and it will keep emitting CO2 for several centuries.
Um, so if we add this into a similar graph for global warming, you see that overshooting the 1.5 degree target with half a degree or one degree gives us significant added CO2 uh, emissions from the from the permafrost on top of what has uh, on top of no overshoot scenarios. So all of this taken together shows us that the permafrost carbon feedback eats up potentially a lot of the remaining carbon budgets to stay below 1.5 degrees or 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 the two or the two the two degree budget. The full squares represent the full carbon budget and then you see this hashed light blue line areas that are what is being eaten up by the permafrost alone. Now it's important to keep mind of this or to, 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 to keep in mind the time scales that are relevant here. So that these permafrost emissions will happen over they will start to really accelerate in the coming decades and they will and they will primarily happen at you know around 2100 or later which means that this doesn't mean that a rapid action you know a rapid action could still limit us to it doesn't mean that we are eating up sort of the window for rapid action on the 1.3 1.5 uh, carbon budget goal but it means that those emissions will still come later and they will to be handled either either they will add to the atmosphere again or they will need to be taken back up with negative emission technologies in the future depending on which trajectories we follow uh, so co closing remarks permafrost thaw emissions are a self-reinforcing global warming feedback for sure um, at the global scale we don't see a lot of evidence that permafrost thaw has any abrupt thresholds every tenth of a, de tenth of a degree matters but there's no clear abrupt threshold on its own permafrost thaw emissions are unlikely to be self-perpetuating in the sense that there is this potential compost bomb scenario whereby so much could be emitted that it would start driving itself. But that is extremely unlikely, I would say. And I, I have not seen many papers supporting that, that hypothesis in, in, in a long time. Uh, but with that said, they do significantly exacerbate human emissions. We see abrupt thaw creating local scale tipping points with irreversible impacts for several centuries. Uh, and we do see that permafrost reduces the remaining CO2 budget, perhaps by half for the 1.5 degree target if we go to overshoot scenarios. Uh, and we, you know, important to note that once triggered, permafrost thaw will cause emissions for centuries. Okay, thank you for listening. I think we'll take questions later on with the full. Or uh, if, if, there's a, if there's a quick question now while, while we're changing slides, that could be good. So are you next? Okay, but then I think we'll move over to Brendan Rogers, who will give, give the next talk. Thank you. Thank you, Gustav. I do have slides, too. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start in the sake of time. Um, so I'm going to investigate the question of whether we see evidence for tipping points in terms of wildfire in permafrost systems. And um, I think this is really important for a couple of reasons. It's, in, it's important because the, the, the term tipping point um, gets thrown around a lot. It's important for the science because um, wildfire and these abrupt permafrost thaw processes are not included in models. It's important from the social dimension because if we do cross tipping points, what does that mean for our collective will to address climate action? And in the case of wildfire, it's, um, it's very important because wildfire disproportionately affects both rural and indigenous communities uh, in the Arctic. So, um, I'm gonna, if you'll indulge me, uh, take you on a little bit of an investigative exercise to ask the question, and I do get this question quite a lot, are we reaching or is there a tipping point for wildfire in boreal forests and Arctic tundra? So I'm gonna get into the weeds a little bit of fire science, but I think it's important to understand in the context of this question. For the sake of time, I'm actually gonna skip the first couple slides because it's review, climate is warming, wildfires are intensifying and they release lots of carbon that's not accounted for. I also had a glitch with this graph in my last presentation, so I know it's not gonna work. And I wanna get to the point of asking the question, what would a tipping point look like for wildfire in high latitudes? And I think from a scientific perspective, I start with 
looking for thresholds? Do we see threshold behavior, right? A threshold behavior can then become a tipping point depending on how acute that threshold is, how quickly we're crossing it. As Gustav mentioned, is it self-perpetuating? Is it reversible? And at what scale is it happening? Is it happening at a couple of points or is it happening at the continental scale to, to um, affect climate? Uh, nope. <laughs> that wasn't part of my slide deck. Okay, here we go. So when I think about uh, tipping points in the context of wildfire, uh, I, I can think about it in terms of burned area. Are we seeing more and more burned area crossing some threshold resulting in a tipping point? Burned area, wildfire is determined by both top-down controls, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but think about it in terms of meteorology, climate, but also bottom-up, so ecosystems, vegetation, soils, etc. But then we can also think about uh, the tipping points in terms of the fire impacts on the system. So in terms of permafrost impacts, in terms of ecosystem impacts, are we reaching potential tipping points? I'm going to start with burned area and move towards the permafrost and ecosystem impacts. So what actually affects wildfire? What is driving wildfire in these permafrost regions? So the top-down controls that we think about are things like temperature and precipitation and humidity and wind. And these govern both um, the fuels that we call, we call vegetation and soil, things that would burn fuel. So how dry are those fuels? But they also affect fire behavior. How likely is it to spread across the landscape? But also climate is affecting the length of the fire season. So just the amount of time we have for fires to burn. Uh, it's also affecting lightning ignitions. With a more, more energy in the atmosphere, we're seeing more lightning ignitions. And on the bottom up side, we think about things like biomass. How much biomass do we have to burn? What is the flammability of that vegetation? The structure of that vegetation, both vertically and horizontally. Duff, which is a fire science term for soil organic matter, fibric layers of the soil how well drained the site is. Uh, that both governs how much below ground fuel there is and how likely it is to dry out. And then at a larger scale, the connectivity of the landscape. So we'll start with the bottom down drivers. And this is a paper that came out recently, just looking at temperature. And I was really quite blown away. I, I knew that the Arctic was warming much faster than the rest of the planet. But I think, I think these two graphs really, really highlight that uh, in a way that I hadn't seen before. And so on the left, we see the time series of global temperature um, for the whole planet, uh, but also the Arctic. And you can see the acceleration. And on the right, what they've done is calculated this Arctic amplification index, basically the ratio at which the Arctic is warming compared to the rest of the planet. So a ratio of one would be the same. And in the 70s and up to mid 80s, it actually was pretty similar. And you can kind of see that on the graph on the left. And then the 80s through most of the 90s, it was almost three times as fast. And in the, 20, in the 2000s, the ratio has been actually above four. So right now, the Arctic is warming around four times as fast as the rest of the planet. So that, by itself, is an acceleration of the dri one of the drivers of fires in these high latitudes. But we know that fires are driven not just by temperatures. They're also driven by, um, for example, precipitation. So I'm going to start with the tundra. This is a, a figure um, that was put together by Who It All in 2015, looking at the response of tundra fires in Alaska to these climate variables. So you have temperature and you have precipitation in the response of these tundra fires. And yeah, when I look at this, I actually do see threshold type behavior, right? If you sort of climb up from the green to the red, in that three-dimensional space, you are going up a slide that is steeper and steeper. So this is evidence to suggest that we are actually seeing some threshold behavior in terms of tundra wildfires response to the climate. That was confirmed by this paper that came out last week in science looking at all fires north of the Arctic Circle. In the last few years, that has really been um, driven by Siberia. And these variables that I'm talking about, like temperature, precipitation, the two, vapor pressure deficit and climate water deficit, there's ways of putting uh, precipitation and temperature uh, together that, that drive fire, length of the fire season and number of ignitions. And in all of these cases, it's a nonlinear relationship. And I do actually see threshold behavior for the response of tundra fires north of the Arctic Circle to these conditions. Now, I would note that these exponential relationships are really really driven by a couple of fire years, 2019 and 2020 especially. So if we take those away, it's a little unclear what the relationship is, but nonetheless, that looks like threshold behavior to me. However, step back, 
to note, most of the fires that are occurring across the permafrost region, across the Arctic boreal zone, are occurring in boreal forests. The vast majority are occurring in boreal forests. And if we look at that relationship, this is a little bit of an older paper, but I really like it because it has a bunch of the responses of boreal forest fires to climate. Here it's across all of Canada, on top temperature, on bottom uh, climate moisture index, and at different scales. So going from about 100 square kilometers to hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. The main point I want to get across here is that this actually looks quite linear, especially if you look towards the right where it's clearer. The response of these boreal fires to um, these, these meteorological drivers looks quite linear. And that actually is pretty consistent with a lot of other papers out there. So my take on the situation for burned area driven by these top down controls is that climate warming is accelerating. We are seeing threshold behavior in tundra regions, regions that have not burned very frequently historically. They are crossing thresholds. They might burn a lot more. That might be a tipping point. Uh, but at broader scales, when we include the boreal, which is the vast majority of burned area, the relationships are likely a lot more linear. Now I'm going to talk about the bottom up controls. So, you know, you have these weather conditions and lightning conditions, but then the vegetation, the ecosystem really affects what happens for fire. So again, I'll start with tundra. There is some evidence informing this model that if you have low to moderate severity fires, uh, the tundra systems are likely to be able to recover. But if you have high severity fires, um, you are changing the permafrost, you are changing the hydrology. And one thing that will happen is you'll get different types of vegetation coming in like shrubs and even trees, and they tend to be a lot more flammable. So that, if that happens in tundra systems, could be reinforcing feedback for more and more fires. I am not gonna lead you through all of these diagrams, but this is another system that could have these self-reinforcing feedbacks. These are peatlands. So basically the model is in these peatlands, and there's a lot of peatlands in Canada and Western Russia, when they burn, well, if they dry from drainage or climate change, and then they burn, the fires tend to be higher severity, it changes properties of the soil, it changes properties of the vegetation, you get more flammable species coming in. This could also be a self-perpetuating mechanism. And this is important because when we go back to these tundra fires that we've been seeing the last couple of years, this map on the left shows everything that burned between 2001 and 2018 in black, north of the Arctic Circle, um, uh, but then 2019 and 2020 is in red. So we had massive fires in the Siberian Arctic and the graph on the, on the map on the right is showing that a lot of these fires are occurring in peatland. So if we are seeing threshold behavior in tundra regions, and especially in these peatlands, that can really matter for these systems. But I do have to say the elephant in the room for these bottom-up feedbacks is what's happening in boreal forests. Uh, again, because they are uh, experiencing the majority of the burned area. And uh, the story is quite different, actually. So in boreal forests, especially those in Alaska and Canada, but also some in Russia, after we see fires, we often see deciduous, so these fires usually occur in coniferous forests, so spruce, uh, fir, pine, um, but a lot of times we'll see increased levels of deciduous vegetation, deciduous shrubs and deciduous trees um, come into the ecosystem uh, after fire. These uh, deciduous trees are less flammable for sure. So this is a picture that I took in interior Alaska it was a white spruce and aspen forest that burned. And you can see the understory just, a, just two years after um, is completely covered with aspen. So this will likely turn into an aspen forest, which is less flammable. So some work, for example, looking at this across all of Canada uh, by Bernier et al in 2015, looked at this um, avoidance or selection ratio of fire. Basically, are some ecosystems more likely to burn than others? And what they found is that, yes, the older forests the coniferous forests were more likely to burn, but the younger forests, the deciduous forests, were less likely to burn. There are some big questions. This is a negative feedback, so a dampening feedback. There are some questions about how this will play out with more warming, more extreme fire seasons. There's some anecdotes from fire managers that this model is no longer working, especially for late season fires. But nonetheless, it still represents a uh, negative feedback um, so that would sort of push the system in the other direction away from potential tipping points. So what is the net result that we see in terms of burned area? Well, we have the best data from across, uh, we're missing a graph. Okay, well, <laughs> there was a graph here. Uh, we had really good data from Alaska and Canada and we've seen about a doubling of burned area, but there's nothing to suggest that it's anything but linear. So I would say for burned area across these large regions, we're not seeing 
We're not seeing an exponential increase. We're not seeing threshold behavior. Just the one on the right is because we don't have much data in Eurasia. So this is a recent assessment looking at fire emissions, but it largely follows burned area. And again, it's it's hard to draw conclusions from about 20 year time series, um, but nonetheless, we're not, we're not seeing any kind of acceleration. Um, there might be a linear increase in burned area. That said, that's across large, large scales. But I do wanna just bring home the point that in the tundra regions, we are probably seeing some threshold behavior. This is looking at the Siberian Arctic, a long-term time series, and you can see the last couple of years, very far into the graph, have, have shot up quite dramatically, including the fires in these carbon-rich peatlands. When we look towards the future, um, this I've shown this uh, globe before, but this is just um, highlighting how quickly the Arctic is warming compared to the rest of the planet. It's represented by topography here, so these mountains. We don't know the exact climate trajectory because that largely depends on what we do as a function of these meetings at COP. But what we can do is look at how fires are expected to change as a function of temperature. And that uh, is a pretty messy graph. These are different regions, different techniques. Um, but again, there's nothing in here to suggest that it's a nonlinear relationship. It's a pretty messy relationship. Um, so again, I, I would say at large scales, there's no evidence that we, we have threshold behavior, uh, but probably linear increases. That said, if you look at the axis, these are pretty big increases. So we're getting up to two, three, four, even higher times fraction of burned area compared to historical. So it's important changes, it's big changes, but it's not necessarily accelerating threshold changes. All right, and then I wanna end just spending a couple minutes um, thinking about the ecosystem or permafrost impacts when you do have a fire. Do we get some of these local tipping points? There are some cases where we certainly see resilient ecosystems. So this is uh, a graph looking at the change in the active layer depth in permafrost after fires. And you can see some increases after a fire. This is for tundra fires in Alaska, I believe. But by and large, over time, these systems are coming back to their pre-fire state. We do know that's not always the case. So this is some really nice modeling work done by Alfin Jafarov for, um, for black spruce uh, forests in Alaska. And what you can see are these, so this is after a fire, year zero would be a fire. In the upland system, if you have deeper and deeper burns, you can, in this model, get complete thaw of the permafrost column. In the lowland system, it's a bit more buffered and resilient, and so even the deeper burns don't necessarily result in complete thawing of the permafrost. And we do know we have observational evidence um, that we can see some abrupt thaw after fire. So this would be a very much a threshold change at that ecosystem at the time of a fire. So these are some pictures from um, Jones et al, 2015. This is the Anaktuvik River fire uh, on the north slope of Alaska. And you can see some, uh, you can see some braided uh, uh, detachment slides. You can see some retrogressive thaw slumps and you can see some ice wedge degradation. So we have all kinds of um, abrupt thaw events occurring uh, after this fire in ice-rich permafrost. And this is just, these are some photos from some work that I did in central Canada. Um, this kind of gets to the other um, uh, tipping point that, that Gustav showed with boreal forest dieback. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that, but this is at the southern range of the boreal forest. On the picture on the left, we have, well, we have are these rapid reburns. So we're seeing burning occur more and more frequently. So this was about a 17 year old jack pine forest that burned. And because of the repeated fires, it's burned completely down to bedrock. So I would love to go back there, but I severely doubt this is coming back as a forest. There's just not many places for the seeds to take hold. And there are cones in these trees, but we also sampled a lot of trees that were too young to even have cones. So they are not able to reproduce. On the picture on the right, this is one of those forests that isn't supposed to burn very much. This is a young deciduous forest. We saw a lot of burning. In the understory, you see lots of grasses coming up. So there are systems, especially on the southern end of the boreal, that if you see more fires, they're likely to transition to shrubs or grasslands because the trees just can't keep up with how rapidly the fires are coming. So um, in conclusion, I would say that tundra regions display accelerating fire behavior related to climate thresholds. Um, the relationships in a boreal certainly appear more linear. And again, that is the vast majority of burned area. I would say um, similar to Gustav's conclusions, there's limiting evidence for one tipping point for all fires across the Arctic boreal zone. And in the language of tipping point, um, that's called a threshold free feedback. We definitely see some ecosystems that are vulnerable to tipping points. So the ones I've identified, upland permafrost, warm permafrost, permafrost with high ground ice, peatlands and short interval reburns in boreal forests. 
but other systems uh, certainly appear more resilient, especially lowlands, wetlands, and permafrost with low ground ice content. Um, but I would say, even if we're not seeing threshold tipping point like behavior, even a sort of linear or semi linear increase of Arctic boreal fires with climate change has implications. This is a positive feedback. This means that if climate change follows more warming scenarios, we will see more emissions. So we're going to get more emissions from those fires with increased warming. Um, and also that some of the lost carbon is irreplaceable on human timescales. But it also means that if we stabilize climate and eventually cool the planet, that fires are likely to follow. So that is my scientific conclusion of are there tipping points in fires in permafrost regions? Thank you. And we can take a question if there is. Yes. Hello, Robert Gibson from Hong Kong. You showed one chart where the ratio between warming in the Arctic and generally was increasing. If you were to extrapolate into the future, what would you predict? It's a good question. Um, my, my sense is that it would be hard for it to go above the ratio of four. Um, you know, some of the, the feedbacks that we're seeing are very likely continue, especially the loss of ground ice um, uh, and the, the fact that the Arctic has a lot more land. I don't have a great answer, but to me, just intuitively, four times the race of the planet feels like a very large increase. And it's almost hard to imagine it being more than that. But I, I, have, I have to admit, I have not looked into that question, but it's, yeah, it, yeah we should, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, a question about that same uh, plot. Um, I think um, in Madrid, the, this booth, the, the cryosphere pavilion, we're arguing that it was two times, two times or two and a half times. And, uh, you know, up until, I think even at the last COP in Glasgow, it was about the same, right? And the literature always said two and a half or two times, and media said that. And yet that graph shows that it was never two times, even like 20 years ago. So what, what gives? Like the scientific community kind of got stuck with that number, never changed it. Yeah. Um, I think part of it has to do with your domain that you're talking about. People use different domain definitions for the Arctic or the poles or high latitudes. So um, if you include lower and lower latitudes or mid-latitudes, you're going to get a very different number. Um, other than that, I'm not entirely sure, but it's a great question. I mean, clearly for some years and decades, it was around two, but it looks like in the last 20 years, it has gotten even higher than that. Yeah. Okay, so next up will be Sue talking about some local tipping points. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sue Natale. I'm a scientist and Arctic program director at the Woodwell Climate Research Center. And I'm going to be talking about local tipping points. And in some ways i'm like why am i up here talking about tipping points because i can't stand talking about tipping points and i hate when i get asked about tipping points there's so much confusion about what is a tipping point and i think we kind of get stuck on oh something's a tipping point it's really bad and something's not a tipping point and oh okay that's not so bad it's not a tipping point and i think that's really really far from reality um, i'm not going to be talking about tipping points in the climate system which is what the two previous presentations were about. I'm talking more generally about just tipping points and local local tipping points. Um, so I have a new definition or a different definition for tipping point, and I have to have a look at it right here. So tipping point is a critical threshold at which a uh, tiny perturbation can qualitatively alter the state or development of a system, often the shifting, shifting the system to an irreversible state. So it's this qualitative change. So when we're talking about a climate tipping, tipping point in the climate system, it's quite different than when you're just talking about a tipping point at the local scale. And so that's what I'll be fo focusing on today. Um, okay, so just you've seen some images like this. This is a picture of abrupt thaw. Um, going from a frozen to a thawed state is clearly a change in the qualitative state of the system. Um, and you can also see it's quite extreme in this case. Again, an another photo at the top of this hill slope in northeast Siberia. This is just a regular forest, large ice wedges, massive ice in the system. The ice melts. 
the ground collapses, you're never going to go back to the original state when you see this happen. Okay. Um, as Gustav mentioned, there's not a single temperature threshold for permafrost thaw in the Arctic. So going from something like this to something like this, this is going to happen gradually. It's already happening in some places. Does it matter? Does it matter? Does that make it not a, a tipping point or not relevant? I'd say for the 5 million people who live in the Arctic, uh, it doesn't matter at all. Okay, so I just want to go to talk about some of the local impacts of permafrost thaw in the Arctic. By 2050, and there's an updated version of this paper but it, the, from this past year, but it's kind of similar patterns. At 1.5 degrees Celsius, about 3 million people uh, will be impacted by permafrost thaw. At 2 degrees Celsius, 3.6 million. Um, and 9 to 33% of people are in high hazard areas. Uh, significant impacts to infrastructure. So 70% of infrastructure in the northern region is in areas with high potential for thaw, 30% in infrastructure with high hazard areas. So a high hazard area is that abrupt ground collapse. 45% um, of gas and oil fields in the Russian Arctic are in high hazard areas. Um, in Alaska alone, there are 73 communities, at least 73 communities, that are facing imminent threats from permafrost thaw, flooding, and erosion. About $5.5 billion um, economic impact. And, and there's zero, like given these, uh, the, the economic costs, the cultural costs, the human costs of these local tipping points, um, no countries currently have any uh, climate relocation governance framework to deal with this. And so regardless of the fact that this may not be a climate tipping point, um, there's some serious impacts that are happening now. So I just want to take a look at what some of these qualitative changes look like. Um, again, this is not a condition, it's a case of abrupt thaw where you see this like massive, you know, houses tumbling off the cliff. But I would say for the person living in the house, this is a qualitative change. So I would call this a tipping point because the house is starting to sink. Um, the house is getting flooded. When the house gets flooded, you get mold on your walls and you have to move out. I would call that a tipping point. Uh, here's another case where this was a place where there was a boardwalk. Uh, these communities, many of the northern communities, uh, there, there aren't often like roads as we think of them. They're boardwalks where you get around like by ATV. Um, this was a boardwalk. Now it looks like a river. Again, I would call that a qualitative change in the state. Um, here's another place. This was a location where someone who lived in this community told me they used to go berry picking. If you haven't been berry picking, you know you don't pick berries in a place that looks like this. You're usually on more upland, drier areas. Blueberries will not grow here. That's a qualitative change. I'd call that a tipping point, even though we're not seeing abrupt ground collapse. And then here's another one. I mean, this is, you know, this is quite typical for many northern areas. The only way in and out is by runway, and these runways are in very, very wet locations, or they're adjacent to uh, a river, right? Because that's how you're getting your supplies in to build the runway. The river is eroding, exacerbated by permafrost thaw. Again, uh, when communities have to move, that's a qualitative change, and it's not going back. You can see the land in this picture starting to sink all around this runway. Um, and even at, at the local scale, there are self-perpetuating um, processes that cause uh, these, at these local scale processes of permafrost thaw for this to continue and for this to be amplified. So this is one, it's called Ustek. Ustek is a Yupik word that means catastrophic land collapse. And it describes the processes of permafrost thaw, erosion and flooding and how they interact to exacerbate eat, eat the other one. So you get permafrost thaw, the ground collapses, it makes it more susceptible to flooding. When you have flooding, now you have water sitting on top of the ground, that water conducts heat into the ground leading to more thaw. When you have ground thaw, the ground, this kind of cement, this solid cement is now muck and that leads to erosion. Erosion leads to more, more thaw. Um, Ustek recently in the past couple years was actually put in as a new hazard in the state of Alaska hazard assessment report, recognizing that these processes aren't happening alone, but these are happening in this broader context. <laughs> 
Okay, and I'm just going to end with some things that I think are policy needs because, I, I, you know, I think what we're talking about a lot when we're thinking about permafrost thaws, we're thinking about mitigation and the, need, and, the, and the great need to address the additionality of permafrost thaw on our global carbon budgets and to take this into account. But at the same time, I think the mitigation needs are also really urgent because of we have this, these impacts that are happening on the ground. So, and the policy needs here, I'm not talking about mitigation, which I do think those are greatly needed, but really in terms of adaptation, what do we need to do to respond to these local scale tipping points? So the first thing is a recognition of permafrost thaw and disaster response planning and support. And I'll speak uh, about the US, which is where I'm from, but I have a feeling this is um, in other countries as well. Things that people consider slow onset, like permafrost thaw and erosion, um, which in a person's lifetime aren't re that slow. Um, we have no mechanism for dealing with these. So in the US, we have FEMA. This deals with the hurricane. But if you get erosion happening and then six months later, your house falls off the cliff, you're out of luck because there's no, there's no policy right now to address this. Okay. Um, the second thing I think we need both in the U.S. and nationally is recognition of and support, financial support, to address the irreversible loss of indigenous lands as a result of permafrost thaw. Northern communities are often let out, left out of the conversation about loss and damage. People are losing not just land and homes, uh, cultural resources and subsistence ways of living. And my third point um, is we the international community in the US and globally desperately need an adaptation governance framework to facilitate the responses to these local tipping points. I think we're spending much needed time on talking about mitigation, but right now, like the clock is ticking. There are communities in the North and elsewhere who are dealing with this and having to make decisions about relocation. And there currently is just no, no plan in place to deal with it. So, um, I'll end there. That's all I have to say about local tipping points. Thank you so much to all three of our speakers. And uh, we have a little bit of time uh, for one or maybe two questions um, from the audience. If anybody has a question, um, and maybe all of our panelists, would, you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> um, I remember going to a talk by Professor Peter Cox, Exeter University, some years back, where he says, when you're looking at are you close to a tipping point, the thing you need to watch is not the signal, but the noise, I, how variable things are. So are we seeing an increase in the noise in some of the things that you're looking at in the Arctic? Yes, uh, I think so. I mean, there's uh, at least some, I mean, some trends are obviously getting increasingly variable. Like, you know, we see an acceleration of, of, of variability in in, in, in in thaw rates locally and regionally, uh, and occurrences of, of abrupt thaw. But I think the, the I think you need to look at the ratio of the noise to the signal, though. So if I mean if if the if the general thaw is increasing exponentially and the noise is also increasing, I wouldn't see that as approaching a tipping point. It's just the ratio to the actual signal. In, in, but that there might be detail. Um, yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think we are seeing more quote unquote noise. Um, does that mean a tipping point is evident? I'm not sure. I don't think that implies that it will happen. But um, we are seeing more and more extreme warming temperatures for sure, especially in high latitudes, records breaking. In terms of wildfire, we're seeing more and more extreme fire years. And I touched on the boreal forest dieback, which I only mentioned because um, it was one of the tipping points that was brought up. We're seeing more of these boreal forests sort of exhibit, um, if you look at sort of the, the vegetation indices, the productivity, we're seeing more noise in cases in the southern boreal that eventually leads to die off. So I think, I think we are seeing more noise, but I, I, I would hesitate to say that that then guarantees we're going to be seeing tipping points. Yeah, and I, I mean, I agree, but I, I guess I'd say the more noise means more abrupt events, right? Like these these high points are is when you have a fire, you know, with these extreme weather events is when you have more abrupt ground collapse in those summers. And so whether it's a tip, that makes it more likely to be a tipping point or not, I don't know, but I think it makes it 
more likely that we're going to see abrupt events. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think we um, are a little bit over time. We do need to wrap up. So if you have like a very, a very brief question, then I, I would argue that the biggest uh, tipping point um, for permafrost would be loss of Arctic sea ice, leading to spikes in temperature in the Arctic, and then the permafrost tip. So I'm talking about cascading tipping points, right? And I mean, none of you m mentioned that possibility because you don't study sea ice, right? Well, uh, we don't specifically study sea ice, but that doesn't mean we're not aware of, of, of the trends in, in uh, happening in sea ice. And uh, I agree that uh, there's uh, uh, there's there's quite strong you know there's strong evidence that there's a link between the extent of sea ice and the regional temperature. And actually, um, I think this um, this actually follows up quite well to your earlier question about why we're seeing an increase in the Arctic amplification relative to global mean warming. And the sea ice loss is one of the key drivers behind that trend that we're seeing of, of that acceleration. Uh, so it's, uh, and, and I also agree that the imminent loss of summer sea ice that we're going to see around 2035, 2040, probably summer sea ice will be gone, will additionally drive, you know, warming on, on, on land. Uh, I don't think it will lead to a tipping point per se. It would just accelerate the linear trend that we're seeing. I don't think that there's a, any evidence that it would cause the system to tip. I do think that there is a concern that we might see a threshold type behavior in subsea permafrost linked to sea ice. I, I talked about that in a session this morning a little bit. And there, there, there is an actual physical mechanism, which is the formation of brine, uh, which is this really, really, really cold, salty water that is formed under the sea ice which sinks and that keeps the bottom waters cold but when you lose the brine you're also going to lose the cold bottom waters that, that might give us a threshold in subsea permafrost but we were just talking about the terrestrial permafrost system today i'll, I'll just briefly want to not exactly comment on sea ice but just say that although we're arguing we're not seeing evidence of tipping points for permafrost of broad scales and wildfire doesn't mean we don't think tipping points necessarily exist I think for some systems like ice sheets and glaciers, they certainly do exist. Okay. Oh. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the questions and to all our speakers. And I think we will wrap up now and reconvene for the next session at four. Thank you.